Hey photographers! While I was very excited by the promise of the Fuji X-H1, the initial firmware release had some issues. So when Fuji promised an upgrade, I put down the camera and waited. Now I've just installed the second upgrade, firmware 1.11, and hopefully it addresses the lockups and resets that I experienced with the initial release. Now I have reset the camera to its initial settings, so here goes. Let me explain, demonstrate, and review. The X-H1 is a 24 megapixel APS-C camera supporting 4K video in both cinema and video aspects with F-Log for extended dynamic range, X-mount lenses, electronic viewfinder, dual card slots, and an optional battery grip, which provides additional flexibility for video and portrait mode shooting. Now, in case you missed it, I did post a preview of the X-H1. That video has some details I won't repeat here and a comparison of the X-H1 and X-T2. I do have plans for more X-H1 videos, comparisons, and tips for video recording, among others. The firmware update added new features. Let me highlight a couple of those, and then the remainder will pop up as we go. There was no update to the manual, but there is a downloadable guide to the new features. There were lots of questions posted about the preview. I'll include answers to those as I go. A new setting provides larger on-screen displays, an option that's available for both viewfinder and LCD. So this is the standard mode, and this is the enlarged version. I'm mostly going to use the enlarged in the review to make it easier to see the settings. One disadvantage, there's no manual focus distance meter in the larger version, and while some items like histogram and level are shared, there's also a new customization panel for the larger display settings. Incidentally, there's no PASM indicator, and if a setting like shutter is missing, that means it's in auto mode. Change to manual, and it appears. Focus has been added as a bracket option, and it's very comprehensive. These nesting dolls are about 30 centimeters front to back, and I'm using the 50 to 140 at f2.8 zoomed in. The closest doll is nearly at the closest focus distance. Now, after a few trials, it takes about 70 images at the maximum distance, 10 units, and I'm taking them continuously. So one shutter press starts a focus burst changing focus and taking images. Inter-image delays of up to 10 seconds can be selected. In playback, there's no in-camera selection where you touch the image to select the focus point, but these are full resolution images, not 8 megapixel captures from a video file. And there's no in-camera stacking, but that's easily done in Photoshop to create a composite of the in-focus images, so now all the dolls are in focus. I can hear micro photographers everywhere rejoicing. But while this firmware has fixed some issues, others remain. When an external monitor is connected, switching to playback is not tolerated. Luckily, it recovers when powered off and on. Previously, that required battery removal to reset. And the X-H1 is made in Japan. The origin is hard to find behind the LCD. And while that's an issue for some, I would suggest to you that Fuji's quality control would be the same regardless of the location of the plant. I'm using the XF Red Badge 16-55 to lens, which I feel is an excellent companion. And with the battery grip, that brings the total weight to 1.7 kilos. Physical exposure dials for aperture on the lens, shutter speed, top right, and ISO, top left, make it simple to take control of this camera, and all have an A position when you want to take advantage of the camera's ability for auto exposure. Now there's no mode dial, but in the standard screen display, the bottom left shows P, A, S, or M, depending on which settings are in auto. These settings are also displayed on the top panel's info display. Fuji calls this the sub-monitor. When it's off, the display shows the remaining card space, images in stills mode, time in video mode, as well as battery status. There are both black on white and white on black options, and like other screens, an extensive customization of the display options, set independently for stills and video. I'm still using the defaults. There is one real advantage to the sub-monitor. When shooting with a lens like the 18-135 to 135 that has an aperture ring but no markings, the screen displays the aperture. 
I like the meter caller under the shutter dial, and not having to dive into the menu to change the meter means now I'm actually using settings other than matrix. And in the menu, there's an option to interlock the focus with the spot meter, that's on by default. The left side meter scale is very useful in manual mode, and in other modes, it's exposure value. By default, press the EV button, simultaneously turn the dial to adjust. Now, if you find that awkward, there's a menu option to change it to a toggle instead of hold to adjust. There's also an option to switch the function of the rear dial, then just turn to adjust. But wait, there's another setting for the back dial. By default, press it and it engages the focus magnifier, then turn to change the magnification. My preference in manual focus is to have the magnifier engage automatically when I turn the focus ring. Set that up by turning focus check on. Touch functionality displayed in the top right includes tap and snap, tap to focus, and focus area selection. The screen can be used as a focus selection touchpad when shooting with the viewfinder. And the touch function works even when an external monitor is connected. That's unexpected. And there are four touch swipe modes to activate various functions. However, I've not been able to figure out the secret to make this work consistently. Touch also works for the Q menu, but not the main menu. As long as we're here, the shutter button on the X-H1 is very sensitive, and I often use the shutter button to close the menu. At first, I was regularly starting video recording or snapping a picture. I've learned to be more light-fingered. The sound of the shutter is also fairly quiet, much quieter than the X-T2. There are multiple shutter options in addition to the default mechanical shutter, which supports shutter speeds up to 1 over 8,000. The electronic shutter goes up to 1 over 32,000, and it is silent. There is electronic with front curtain, also very quiet. This mode reduces the shutter lag slightly. A combined mode shoots mechanical up to 1 over 8,000, then switches to electronic for higher speeds. Another combination shoots electronic up to 1 over 2,000, then mechanical to 1 over 8,000, and one final one adds electronic for shooting up to 1 over 32,000 to the previous. The X-H1 has in-body stabilization, a new feature for Fuji. You can see this working when using the expanded view in manual focus. This is without and now with, clearly much more stable. And there are lots of ways to evaluate stabilization. I like to see how long a shutter I can handhold. With stabilization off, I'm losing it at an eighth, and then with it on, I can get down to a second. For one of my favorite shots, blurred traffic. The flicker reduction, which is not compatible with the electronic shutter, delays the shutter until it senses the light pulses are at their maximum. The dial's shutter speed settings are in one-stop increments. For the intermediate adjustments, use the back dial, which selects one and two-thirds up and down from any setting. The dial is also used for settings faster than 1 over 8000. If the control seems not to be working, remember that you just set the EV to toggle, so press it once to return to shutter adjustment. And for fussy video shooters, in video mode, 1 over 48 is available, so you can shoot 24 frame with an exact 180 degree shutter. Fuji offers three auto ISO settings, each with a default, a maximum, and a minimum shutter speed. The dial selects from 200 to 12,800, as well as L and H, which are configured in the menu. Somehow that's with the button dial settings. There are three low settings and two high, up to 51,200. The trick here is to set the ISO dial to Command. Now, if the ISO dial is at A, turning the front dial covers the entire range from 100 to 51.2, and then the three auto settings. Now, you may be wondering why the exposure meter is changing, but the display is not. I turned preview exposure off while you weren't watching. And when I turn it back on, you'll see the exposure change in the image as well as the meter. What's odd is that when the preview is off, the histogram doesn't work. With some cameras offering stratospheric ISOs, the X-H1's 51200 seems limited, and grain starts to appear at 128 
However, even at 51.2, it remains free of extraneous color noise, so maybe better to have less. If you're starting to be overwhelmed by all the menu options, rest assured that most of what I've just covered is a one-time configuration to get the dials working the way you need. What I'm not showing you is the aggravation of the Fuji menu system, which resets to screen one each time, making fine-tuning or testing settings overly cumbersome. The solution here is to use the My Menu configurations, which is handy, but many of the items we've been adjusting and I'd like to add, like button dial settings, are not available. Format, which I also use just about daily, is also not available, but there's a two-button shortcut. Hold down the delete garbage can and press the rear command dial. The small EFX8 flash is included, slide it on and raise it. The menu includes an extensive capability to control the F8 and other external flash units. TTL, manual and commander modes are available. Focus options are selected using a switch on the front side. Before selecting the focus area, set AF mode to All. Then press the focus joystick to select the area. With All, turning the front dial cycles through all six sizes of single point, three sizes of zone, and whole screen in single, or tracking in continuous. This is the 91 point screen. The larger inside points are phase detect, the smaller outer are contrast, or switch to the 325 point selection screen. Now let's go over some of the focus issues. I wish Fuji would document some of the limitations and restrictions in the manual. Finding them while you're shooting can be frustrating. In stills, single focus mode face detection works identifying faces, switch to face plus eye to detect an eye, or if it identifies the right eye and you want the left, that can be forced. In continuous focus mode, face but not eye is available. In video mode, turning face detection on forces continuous. Face detect for video has its own menu position and the eye detect settings are dimmed out and it identifies an. For manual focus, in addition to expanded view, press and hold the rear dial to switch to digital split image and the focus peak mode. The MF Assist setting in the menu offers multiple color and sensitivity options. In the viewfinder, press DISP to switch to dual view, which displays a second window with the focus area while the larger window shows the whole frame. In the setup menu, dual display can switch these so that the focus window is the larger frame. This display is not available in video mode. One feature I'm enjoying, when the monitor screen is flipped up, the eye sensor stops working, which means that if you're holding the camera close, it no longer turns off the LCD. Nice. In operation, with my index finger on the shutter, my thumb falls nicely on the AF on, and like other focus operations, it's speedy and confident. Danielle asked about back focus. In the setup button dial setting, Function settings include the AF on button. By default, the AF on button initiates focus and it works in manual focus mode. Now use the button dial menu to disable the shutter and focus interlock for either single or continuous autofocus modes. By default, the right control pad button selects the white balance. In addition to auto and a selection of presets, Kelvin can be set and three custom settings can be captured and saved using a gray card. A white balance shift can be created with adjustments across the blue and red axis. Use the Q menu to adjust the highlight, shadow, color, and sharpness. Sadly, these settings are not interactive. Use the menu to adjust the grain setting effect, off, weak, and strong. Using mono, the resulting images are off, weak, and strong. Of course, Fuji's signature color management feature is the film simulation, providing adjustments to emulate the look of analog film stocks like Provia, Velvia, and Astia, as well as the digital-only classic Chrome. There are pro-negative high and standard, 
Eterna or Cinema, more about that in a minute. Then Acros, a black and white film with three filters, as well as a standard mono with the same filters and then sepia. It's worth noting that if you're shooting RAW plus JPEG, these settings are applied only to the JPEG file. And personally, I often shoot in mono as I feel it enhances my creativity. So it's nice to have the color data in the RAW file, just in case. Raw settings include lossless compression and uncompressed. Save Data Setup configures how files are saved using the dual slots. Sequential fills one card before switching to the other. Backup records to both. Raw JPEG records each type to its own card. Video can be assigned to either slot, but there's no backup option for video. Peter asked about Select Folder, which can customize the last five characters following the assigned three digits. Now, after the folder is created, it won't appear on the card until an image is taken. Once you have multiple folders on the card, select the folder where you wish to store images. Note that Select is only available with the sequential setting. While I frequently say that memory is inexpensive enough that I never use anything less than the maximum setting to save every possible bit of data, it's worth noting that a 64 gigabyte SD card can hold 984 images of uncompressed RAW plus JPEG fine. Switching to lossless compressed increases that by over 50% to 1,607, so... To simplify the complexity of changing a selection of settings from one situation to another, up to seven custom settings can be created with specific white balance, dynamic range, grain, and film sims. These can be assigned to any of the custom buttons, including the four swipe motions. Once assigned, press the button to select the custom setting. Firmware updates added to the wireless connectivity. The X-H1 has both ad hoc Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Once paired and with Bluetooth on, the camera can be set to sync both time and GPS location data with the phone. Both Bluetooth pairing and GPS icons appear on screen when they're active. Worth noting that if it gets annoying, like the GPS fault display here, in spite of the extensive display customizations, there isn't one to control the GPS icon. Images can be set to auto-transfer, although with an iPhone, you do have to manually select the camera's Wi-Fi network. The LED on the right of the back panel flashes if there are pictures remaining to transfer. The app's remote control capability is fairly robust, it can set aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and select the film simulation. And it can take stills or video. I did play extensively with the advanced filters, a position on the drive dial, and wrote about that for Fuji Love magazine. The individual settings are selected from the drive menu's advanced filter setting. Or press the front Fun 2 button. Although these are mostly gimmicky, I did find some useful capabilities. And they're kind of fun to play with when you're bored. For instance, Selective Color took these interesting images of mailboxes. One dial setting past advanced filters to Panorama. Use Angle to select two sizes M6400 pixels wide and L9600 pixels and four directions. Here's my tip. Use Large and Top to Bottom. Turn the camera to Portrait and sweep the scene left to right for the best panorama results with a vertical dimension of 21,060 pixels instead of 1440. And did you notice that the display rotates to portrait mode when you turn the camera? Isn't that nice? It happens on both the LCD and the viewfinder. On the other side of the drive dial, there are three burst modes, CL, CM, and CH. For burst, I'm recording fine JPEGs to a UHS-2 card with manual exposure and focus settings. I activated the performance boost, set the drive dial to CH, continuous high. The highest available with the mechanical shutter is 8 frames, and that's a fact. A solid and continuous 8 frames per second for as long as you hold down the shutter. 479 images in 60 seconds without stuttering. Impressive. Switching to the silent shutter, 14 frames are available, and there's no indication that you're shooting except that the on-screen settings have disappeared. It does capture 14 frames for the first 2 seconds, 
but then slows quickly to about 8 per, and the 60 second total is actually slightly less, 475. With the optional battery grip and switching back to the mechanical shutter, now 11 frames are available and recorded for 6 seconds, then stuttering and slowing rather dramatically to about 5 per second, a total of 147 in 20 seconds. So 11 and 14, not as useful as the 8 frame mode. I set up the Playmobil train to combine continuous autofocus with burst using wide tracking with the spot set on the point where the train enters the focus area. Focus picks up and follows the train. The images are all in focus and while this is very good, there are cameras with a faster response and a larger coverage area. An interval timer is available but not as a drive mode. From the camera tab, Intervals can be set from 1 second to 24 hours, shooting from 1 to an infinite number of frames. The start time can be delayed. There's no option to save the time lapse as a video file, nor is there a time lapse option on the movie menu. And remember that if you are creating a movie, probably best to switch the resolution to 16 by 9, and even the medium setting will create files larger than needed for 4K. Timer settings are also found in the menu. 2 and 10 seconds are available. To take more than one image, switch to a burst mode, which takes five images. An extensive set of video features make the X-H1 a highly useful video camera. There is a crop when video is selected using the mode dial, and the video menu runs over four screens, and these settings are independent of the still settings, so switching to video reconfigures the camera. Settings at the top, including time available on one, or in this case both cards, for the current frame and data rate. There is no video record button. After switching the drive dial to video, the shutter button stops and starts recording. I didn't find any option to assign video recording to another button, but let me know if you did. 4K and HD are supported, with both the video-friendly 16x9 aspect and the cinema-friendly 17x9 format. Depending on the aspect and resolution setting, frame rates from 24, both drop and non-drop, up to 60 frames are available. At 4K Cinema, only 24 is supported, and 60 frame is available only for HD 16x9. The third column selects the recording bit rate, for HD up to 100 megabits, for 4K up to 200, substantially above the average for consumer cameras. Now note that these higher bit rates will require a UHS-2 type card, which is supported in both card slots. Now video recording times are limited, time available switches to the amount of time remaining, 4K recordings are limited to 15 minutes, HD to 20. However, with the optional battery grip which I highly recommend if you're shooting video, the limit for both increases to 30 minutes. The grip attaches easily and holds two batteries. The screen shows the battery status and complains if you don't use the new 126S batteries displaying its status in yellow. The grip comes with a charging cable and when it's connected, the camera is powered from the mains, effectively removing the battery as a limitation to recording. When it's connected, the display reverts to a single battery. The grip also includes a headphone jack, a most welcome addition. Video can be recorded to the SD or to an external recorder via HDMI. There are settings to manage that. There's no combination that supports 4K to both. Recording only to an external recorder removes the time limit. There are settings to control the external recorder from the camera and to configure time code to the HDMI out. When the moon was shining over the lake, Several of you were wondering about seamless recording from one card to another. The X-H1 can record video to both SD slots, but not simultaneously. At the 200 megabit 4K data rate, a 64 gigabyte card holds about 35 minutes of video. Clips are saved in seamless 4 gigabyte chunks, about two and a half minutes each. When one card fills up, it seamlessly transitions to the second card. The SD card icon switches from 1 to 2, or vice versa. What you can't do is insert or remove cards while recording. If you do, 
the camera powers off. Focus area is less capable in video mode, there's only one size, and it's selectable only when AF mode area is selected. Multi is full autofocus. And there's an odd effect in continuous auto. Even though the focus on the mounty in the foreground doesn't change, watch the background where there is clearly some breathing visible. Switch to manual and it stops. There are settings to adjust the tracking sensitivity from quick to locked on and speed from slow to fast. The same exposure controls apply to video and I do reset the shutter speed to 1 60th after switching to video mode. Frank asked about photometry, the meter's measuring mode for video. Photometry is set on the collar and the current mode is displayed screen left beside the exposure meter display. Spot center weighted, multi, and full screen. Switch to video and the icon disappears and the setting defaults to multi. Now Frank also wanted to know about false color and zebras. Although neither is supported, the display custom setting highlight alert will flash when highlights blow out. Many of you, including Nicholas, asked about stepped exposure adjustments while shooting video. And with both shutter and aperture on manual, it would be nice to be able to rely on the camera to make smooth adjustments if there's a change in light or when you move from dark to a light environment. Using auto ISO, the transition is reasonably smooth. With auto aperture, it's clearly stepped. So if you do need to make auto exposure adjustments, use auto ISO. In video, EV adjustment is limited to two stops up and down, ISOs up to 25.6 can be used, and the slowest video shutter is one quarter second, which creates a nice blur effect. So with an ISO of 25,600 and a lens that opens to f2.8, the light of a single candle is enough to illuminate this scene, which admittedly is a little noisy, but I think that it works. I did capture a custom white balance for this scene, and we're using the classic chrome film simulation. I did use autofocus continuous, and I put the square on my chest in the hopes that face detect, which is also on, might detect my face, but no luck. I would never consider a camera's stabilization in body, lens, or combined to provide a solution suitable for video, certainly not one that's equivalent to using a tripod or a gimbal. And that said, the X-H1's in-body stabilization does help. This handheld shot is usable, and the handheld pan is reasonably smooth. Let's go back to the Eterna film simulation, as it's designed for cinema claiming to provide subdued colors and deep shadows. Combine a Turner with a dynamic range setting of 400% and an ISO of 800 to provide the equivalent of 12 stops of range. Well, that of course sent me to DSC Labs to measure the dynamic range. With ISO at 800, eventually that's the minimum for F-Log as well, shutter at 1 60th, F11 triggers the highlight alert on the leftmost rectangle. Each one to the right is one stop less. Eight, maybe nine chips are visible. Switching to Eterna, with the recommended dynamic range setting of 400%, about 11 stops are revealed. And finally, F-Log, which reveals 11, maybe 12, but at a more uniform distribution from white to black. Although my usual counsel is to make your color corrections manually, Fuji does provide free downloadable LUTs, and they provide a good starting point. There are individual audio settings for the internal and external mics, as well as a limiter, wind filter, and low cut filter to remove the rumble. That's appreciated. The manual references an overheating icon, but I've not seen it, even on warm days with lots of recording. Video can also be recorded in the high speed mode, which records silent videos at 120 or 100 frames into files that play back from two to five times slow. These recordings are in HD 1080 format with a bandwidth of 40 megabits. That makes sense. Recordings are limited to 6 minutes, so that in playback, no video exceeds 30 minutes. There is an interesting movie silent control mode, which disables the dials and provides on-screen touch controls to select and adjust 9 different exposure and color settings. 
there are recording lights front and back, along with a variety of options for which do or do not flash and or blink while recording. Lester asked about shooting video with the Fuji Camera Remote app, and that remains a sore point. It's recorded at 720, 30 frames, 23 megabit data rate, regardless of the in-camera settings, and there are no settings in the app to change that. Fuji's menu isn't as aggravating as some, but the reset to screen one can be annoying. My menu would be better if more settings were included, and the various parts of the setup screen could be better organized. Why are the ISO settings with button dials? One nice touch in the menu, when the mode dial is in video position, the menu button defaults to the movie settings. One of my complaints is the lack of information, both on screen or in the otherwise useful manual, when an item is not available. For example, here the flicker reduction setting is not available, and it took some experimenting to figure out that it's not available when an external monitor is connected. Urgh. Battery life is short, but that's to be expected. Again, I recommend the battery grip. Even if I go shooting without it, I've got two backup batteries. You may wish to compare the X-H1 to the X-T2. Click here to watch that video. Now, like all cameras, the X-H1 has some quirks. However, we can count on Fuji to address some in upcoming firmware releases. More than most manufacturers, Fuji does continue to support older models with new features. For example, the Create Folder feature has recently been added to the X-T2. And hopefully this covers everything you need to know. I don't have all the answers, but will do my best with relevant questions and civil comments. Now, shoot until your memory card is full and your battery is empty, and please do what makes YouTube creators happy. Subscribe. Hey, thanks.